when we really get uh, close to sort of this ideally strong version of ourselves. You know, to me, strength isn't, you know, overcoming things and, and making those things disappear. It's to me being strong is I do what I want when I want, regardless of how I might be feeling at the time. That's a strong person. Hey everyone, welcome to The Rowe Show. I'm your host Greg Rowe, and this week we have mental strength coach Mike Gillette. He has done some of the craziest stuff with his bodies as you will see in the interview. He holds several world records, is a best-selling author, and takes much of his training mentality from his years of being a SWAT team commander. We are going to discuss what it means to actually be mentally strong, and how athletes can benefit from a tougher mindset and training, instead of the common trend to try and make athletes feel comfortable. Mike thinks you need to push right through to be mentally tough. If you're an athlete struggling with fear and anxiety, you'll get truly inspired in this episode. All right, everyone, let's go. Mike Gillette, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you? Hey, Greg, I'm doing well. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, no, thanks, man. You're a hard guy to get a hold of. You are all over the place doing your stuff. Can you, can you give our audience a bit of a background on what you do exactly for those of you who don't know? Uh, sure. Basically, I work with uh, individuals and organizations to uh, enhance their mental capabilities. Now, that's not from like a neurological productivity standpoint. That's basically a, a behavioral standpoint, uh, learning strategies to more effectively manage uh, complex stimulus, stress, those sorts of things. It's a, you know, a particular interest to the athlete community uh, because that's a, uh, an achievement-focused endeavor. It's very quantifiable. You, know, you, you either nail the routine or you don't. You either you know, win or you don't. You get the score or you don't. So it's uh, a universe in which people are looking for improvement, even if that improvement is uh, of a very incremental nature because sometimes that's all that, that it takes to uh, to move you from world class to world champion so i occupy that space and i got into that space in kind of an unusual way i became a, a training expert quote unquote uh, many years ago in a very specific field of endeavor my primary uh, students in those days were uh, law enforcement personnel SWAT teams military personnel and the, the world that they operate in is, in a sense, very similar to the world that athletes operate in. It is a performance-oriented arena. It's not theoretical. And the, uh, the implications of, of not being successful, obviously, are serious. Now, you know, it, it's serious to your career as an athlete. It's serious uh, to your safety and well-being if you are an armed professional. So I basically started working at ways to solve uh, you know, mental development conundrums in a very exacting universe. And over a period of time, that sort of unintentionally, actually, Greg, uh, started to uh, blend into the athlete universe. I didn't start working with athletes per se until 2006. It's when I was still living in Las Vegas and Las Vegas being sort of the, uh, the spiritual hub of combat sports, be it boxing, kickboxing, MMA, and so forth. Those were the first kind of athletes that I started working with. And, uh, you know, from a mentality or temperament point of view, uh, that seemed like a good fit. Arming those athletes for battle seemed to have some uh, carryover to the world that I had uh, been coming from. But in the intervening years, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, every conceivable athlete, you know, from you know, the hardcore, you know, fighters uh, to precision-based athletes, and we're talking, you know, gymnastics and tumbling and things like that, and all of the team sports in between. So does that answer the question reasonably well? Yeah, that's a great answer. So when you work with all these different teams and different athletes, have you noticed a trend? Is, are all these athletes kind of the same mentally and come up with the same problems mentally that you can fix? Or does every industry have its own set of unique quirks that you got to adapt to? Um, 
I'll say yes and yes, but I will expand on that. Um, the one thing that uh, I think any athlete would understand intuitively is whatever sport you come from, it, it's sort of a closed society in a sense. It has a particular worldview. It has not only unique performance criteria, but uh, mentalities that seem to be common to that sport. Uh, golfers tend to be similar to one another. Tennis players tend to be similar to one another. The uh, situations that I encounter when I work with gymnasts, say, uh, have a lot of commonality, whether they're you know high end or you know less less rigorously competitive, whether they're male or female. Uh, so there, there's commonalities, but then there's also unique uh, aspects as well. And the unique really has to do with the individual. I mean, if you're if you're coaching a gymnastics club and you have 30 athletes, you essentially have you know 30 discrete individuals. Some of them will have characteristics in common, but in order to get the most out of any one of those athletes, you also have to sort of develop a sense for how best to reach that particular personality. You know, you as an athlete, Greg, had a particular approach to competing that was unique to you. Now, similarities to other uh, teammates, perhaps, but you were definitely you and you knew that about yourself. And I'm sure that your coaches, if they were very good, uh, also understood that as well. So it's uh, it's sort of a layered uh, phenomenon. You know, there are sports culture uh, characteristics that are, are similar with each sport, but then with within each each team or individual, you know, we all have our own particular motivations, our own uh, things that we respond to well, and, and strategies all similarly that are are less effective. Not everybody really responds to the same uh, sort of cueing or the same sort of uh, you know coach persona, that kind of thing. No, I totally understand. Yeah, everyone's a little bit different. I remember getting into a bit of trouble with uh, my competition coaches because I would always want to come out with my little Yoshi slippers because they were fun. I got them at like uh, some mall or whatever, and they were like my warm-up slippers because, you know, the ground was cold. So, But they didn't like that because it basically was like having too much fun is the way I thought of it as a kid. Uh, but now I realize it's just, you know, every, <laughs> everyone's got to be the same, so everything's professional. I get it. But to me, it's like, guys... Have a little yeah. fun with this, you know. So I understand exactly what you're talking about where there is that consistency between the cultures. But, you know, a little bit of spice here and there individually really is what I think gives the sport heart. If everyone's just a robot just doing the same thing, then what's the point, right? But, you know, it's interesting. So when you work with gymnasts specifically, um, is there a list of two or three issues that generally that you see over and over again? Yeah. Um, now, my, my list is actually very short, but the list of what we might refer to in a medical sense, presenting symptoms, uh, tend to be uh, similar. And those are things like, uh, you know, balking, uh, not being able to translate practice performance into competition performance. You know, th th those are the, the main ones. Uh, if we break it down a little bit more specifically, you have an athlete coming back from an injury and they have a hesitancy to throw a particular skill, particularly if it's the skill that you know injured them in the first place. And what I have found, even though not, not everybody sees it this way, but my impression of most uh, sports-based uh, difficulties are that they have to do with fear, fear of some kind. You know, so if we're talking about perfectionism, you know, it's fear of making a mistake. It's fear of letting down the team, fear of disappointing the coach, fear of disappointing the parents. Uh, you know, we, we can label things in all kinds of uh, very specific sounding ways. But at the end of the day, what we're ultimately trying to tame is fear. You know, the ability to perform, and, you know, fear sounds intense. Well, I'm not afraid to do tumbling. I'm not afraid... You know, to play baseball, it's not that. It's the the fear is found within the confines of the endeavor, and it's typically rooted in a very simple idea, which is if this sport is meaningful to you, you want to do it very well. 
the meaning is what creates the stress. The meaning is what creates the pressure. And a lot of people have, I think, mistaken ideas about what it means to be afraid or what it means to feel pressure. You know, they're instantly attributing that as a, as a negative manifestation of something. And we need to run away from it. We need to hide from it, deny that it even exists. And none of those methods work. I mean, if you can get them to work in the short term, you're actually in a, in a pretty rare company. And what I've found is, you know, mainstream sports psychology is really geared towards making people uh, feel comfortable. And superficially, that sounds reasonable, and, and who doesn't want to feel comfortable? But it denies the reality of, of where you are, and it also creates unintentionally uh, sort of uh, an internal conflict that never really goes away. You know, if we think of some really uh, simple approach that uh, some people might recommend, you know, a lot of coaches talk about this, the idea of affirmations where we just take a positive statement or maybe several positive statements and we just repeat them to ourselves. Maybe we do it standing in front of a mirror. Maybe we write it down 10 or 20 times every morning or maybe before we go to bed at night. And the idea behind it is pleasant. I mean, it's never a bad idea to say positive things about yourself or positive things about yourself within the context of your relationship to your sport but the problem arises if we don't actually believe whatever it is that we're saying or writing to be true what we do then is we create uh, internal resistance a, a type of, of friction that comes from within so if i'm standing in front of my mirror hypothetically and i'm a track and field athlete and I'm telling myself 20 times in a row, I'm an amazing pole vaulter. Now, if I believe that, then it's great. But how many people actually believe that? If you're saying it into a mirror, odds are you probably don't. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Are, this, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. And odds are this has been recommended to you to compensate for the fact that you don't. So what happens literally uh, on an internal basis, every time I say I'm an amazing pole vaulter, my internal mind says, using very specific language, no, you're not. And every time I say it, no, you're not. You know, I'm a confident and capable athlete. No, no you're, you're not. not. Yeah. And the no, you're not is coming from you don't really believe the thing. And if you don't believe the thing, it doesn't matter how many times you say the thing. It's, That's it's a guess. pleasant idea. But, you know, it's, it's like if I stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm a billionaire. I'm a billionaire. Well, <laughs> oh man, I, okay. I'm going to start right now. That doesn't, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hate to interrupt the conversation, but I got to go to the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror, make some money. Um, you know, but it literally is the same, you know, sort of phenomenon or lack of phenomena. So, one of the reasons I believe that uh, I am as effective as I'm able to be working with athletes, and I've been effective fairly quickly is that I don't come from a sports background. I come from an entirely different background. When you're preparing people to go into the most dangerous circumstances imaginable, the way that you prepare them is not to say, and when you kick in the door of the drug lab and all of those meth addicts raise their guns and point them at you, you're going to feel calm. <laughs> You're going to feel in control. You're going to feel confident. Well, that would seem ridiculous, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm because laughing. only a knucklehead would feel calm and comfortable in that situation because the stakes are too high. Your margin for error in terms of you know, your performance goals uh, are very slim. And that is the approach uh, that I've, I've taken with athletes. You don't pretend that the fear isn't there. The fear is not only real, it's a preferable thing to have happen. The reason that fear exists is to warn us of impending physical danger. That's why we have it. It's a self-preservation mechanism. Now, everybody knows this, but what's less clear is when you don't live... 100,000 years ago, 
when you're not being chased through the woods by, you know, tigers and bears or members of other tribes who just want to cave your head in with a club just because that's what people do. Um, (laughs) You know, your your sense of physical danger, your intuition was, was was a very important part of you just making it through every day. Because once upon a time, almost everything people did could kill you. From you know, drinking poison water from the wrong stream, to eating the wrong plant, to going after meat, and that meat decides to go after you, and it kills you. It was a different world. So here we are now in this amazing age that uh, affords us so many amenities and comforts. We're still neurologically wired the same way. So our, uh, our minds analyze our environment every day looking for problems to solve. It's part of how, how your mind tries to help you. And your mind does it in a way that ends up not necessarily being helpful given the modern, comfortable era in which we live. Okay. That's interesting. The person who wakes up at 3 a.m. and and their mind is racing, they can't get back to sleep. It's like suddenly every problem that they've got on their plate is just being magnified in high definition and spooled in an endless loop. And people will talk about that. You know, I woke up in the middle of the night the other night and I could not go back to bed. I just kept thinking about, you know, house repairs and, back taxes and whatever the problem might happen to be. Now, people misunderstand what that is. They just think there's something wrong with them. They're negative uh, thinkers and so on. Ultimately, what they are are normal. The mind is doing what the mind thinks it's supposed to do. The mind looks for problems because the mind wants to solve problems. But not everything is a problem. And certainly in this day and age, not everything is life and death. But that's not how your mind sees it. So if we look at a sports application, the things that cause stress within sports are not necessarily life and death, but the way that our minds can process them, they start to feel that way. And suddenly coming back from an injury and being hesitant, actually afraid, to throw a particular skill becomes a larger and larger issue. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the athlete. It's not because they're coach doesn't know what they're doing it's simply because a mind untrained you know can go in some very non-productive directions what so getting back to the question everything will ultimately have its root in fear of some kind because we're wired for that but the way to deal with it is not to pretend it's not real to invalidate the fear we understand the fear for what it is and the way that we become successful is we do it like a soldier preparing for battle. You know, we mimic the conditions of the battlefield and we train for that particular reality. We learn how to manage multiple streams of stimulus. We learn how to function in high stress environments. We don't try to take the environment and psychologically bubble wrap it for the athlete because that's not how it's going to be come competition time. So that makes sense. It makes complete sense. So you you hit a lot of great points there. So the first one, I like your your thought process about going back in time because yeah, when you compare back in the day where everything was life and death and things were a lot more serious, you know, um, you know, obviously you had real fears and that's where you're wired up to almost kind of always be on that sort of platform. But nowadays, when Obviously, the worst thing I got to deal with is, is there going to be traffic today? Oh, am I going to get fired where I can just easily get another job in some other industry? Because compared to 100,000 years, you can't just get another job in the village. If you if you suck at eat, uh, hunting tigers, there's no computer to go work at. There's no, you can't become a secretary. You just died. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so now it's almost That's like we... exactly right. Right? So now it's like, but what we've done now is because like you said, the brain is still interprets the world that way because that's just the stimuli. That's it's, it's all relative at the end of the day. Now we are taking the things that really the like, cavemen would laugh at the problems that we have. You know, they'd be like, "What? I can't believe that you find this a problem." And I'm not going to name it because I don't want to call anyone out. But you know that general trend of it's really not that bad. Don't be a spoiled brat. Basically, you're seeing that go- getting into athletics in a sense. Where do you see the kids now or the younger generations? are more fearful of things that you maybe weren't so fearful, you know, in previous generations? Is it just getting worse? Um, I'm going to say it's, it's certainly different. 
Now, um, you're older than some of the athletes you work with. I am older than a lot of the athletes I work with by about 99%. <laughs> and, you know, so as, as time goes by, we do see these, these generational uh, trends that you mentioned. And one of the things that makes it difficult for coaches now is that the, the young athletes that they're given to work with have grown up in, in an era that is much different than their own. And one of the, the things I found myself working on that really relates to your question, Greg, is communication skills for coaches. Because what we are as, as people uh, in, in a great sense is you know, we're, we're data recorders. So it's the reason that uh, people, when they start having kids, will catch themselves saying, I never thought I'd say that to my kid. My dad used to say that to me, and it drove me nuts, and it just came out of my mouth. I didn't even realize it. Well, it's because we have this great capacity to store information. And you know, from, from there, it's just about recall. So much of how a, an athlete was coached when they were young uh, has a tremendous likelihood of coming back out when they are in – the coaching role and what was effective for them they often find doesn't really speak to or translate well to today's contemporary athlete so the way that we you know communicate has a a well obviously has a tremendous bearing on on everything i mean if, if you're a good teacher regardless of the medium you're automatically a good communicator and it's also why you can take someone who was you know, a multiple world champion and because of this you know, great resume, they automatically go into the world of coaching and then they find themselves frustrated or their athletes find themselves frustrated because uh, being an exceptional technician does not always uh, you know, correlate to strong communication skills. You well, know, of course, the good news is you can always develop those. Well, it's interesting that so, you... It's interesting that you say that because um, I find that communication is the big problem. I find the technique is kind of like um, it's something that kind of develops on its own a lot more than people realize. Just trial and error sort of in a very systematic sort of way can do that with or without a coach. I think it's the coach's job to be able to communicate in a way that always reminds the athlete they've done a little bit better, gone a little bit farther, or they got off track a little bit and they need to get back on track. But it's more that they're doing the guiding process, not the learning process. And I think that's where some coaches really mess up. And I think that goes against or goes exactly with what you're saying is that coaches are almost uh, forgetting about the communication part and they're getting right to the athletes uh, thinking they're just pure technicians. But the reality, the athlete is a technician technician in their own biological sense subconsciously through years and years of evolution and the coach really needs to be there to translate the world and do the communication for today's real world rather than just be the technician that's already wired into the biology to a large degree that's a that's a really interesting point that's a that's a pretty deep point uh, but I, I think it is very important um, you know, when we get on to the topic of communication now even though we're talking about communication we're sort of creating a, you know, a differentiation you know from mind skills it they're not uh, you, you can't bring about any uh, you know positive development or, or learning moment if you don't have the communication skills so I, I see them as uh, completely co-mangled but you know, for anyone listening to this, they might think that, okay, now we've jumped over here. We didn't really jump. We're still sort of talking about the same thing. Uh, you need to be able to learn the skill as an athlete uh, before you can learn how to perform the skill uh, as, as an exceptional performing athlete, if that makes sense. And some of the interesting things that, that uh, you create barriers as far as just the communication process is um, there are some coaches – who were successful athletes. And we know from successful athletes that there's a spectrum. There are athletes who are extremely industrious and they are so diligent about wanting to be good that they'll put in the repetitions. They'll just, they'll literally will themselves into excellence. 
And then there's that really uh, unique outlier type athlete that they literally see something done and they can pretty much do it. It's like their understanding of how to translate what they've just seen you know, into expressing it with their own body is just, you know, it's very quick and it's very sophisticated. And it can make them very effective competitors and it can give them absolute uh, frustration as a coach. Because if you're a natural and you're dealing with mortals, <laughs> that's tough. Because why don't they understand what I'm saying? I just, I just showed them the skill. Why aren't they doing it? Because that was normal for that, for that coach when they were an athlete. So sometimes you can be handicapped by your own uh, just innate talent. So there's any number of things that can impede uh, the communication process. And I'll just share a quick analogy and we can move on to uh, another topic if you'd like. Um, I look for teaching uh, tips everywhere. And recently, uh, I have been looking at a particular website. It's called Tonebase. And you want to talk about a niche website. It's for people who study classical piano at a high level. And there are 30-plus different world-class classical pianists that uh, have created a series of lessons. And all of the lessons have to do with learning one particular piece of music. Because when you're occupying that space, you'll spend months just perfecting one piece for performance purposes or competition purposes or both. And what... I've been getting from Washington, because I'm, I'm not a classical uh, piano player, let's get that straight, but what's fascinating is all of these world-class musicians were taught by similarly world-class teachers, and all of those teachers had their own approach. So when I watch these lessons, what I'm listening for is not how to play a particular complicated passage by Chopin. I'm listening to how they explain how to do different things. What is the language of excellence? How, how do you explain something that is ex extremely technical in nature and yet also is imbued with uh, a, a great amount of artistic interpretation? To me, it's like listening to a gymnastics coach. You know, an endeavor that is extremely mathematical and extremely artistic. And it's, like, it's essentially the same thing as going to the ballet and scoring the dancers. That, to me, is what gymnastics is. Okay. You know, taking the infinitely complex and making it beautiful and, and consistent and all of those other things. So what I do is uh, every chance I... Yet I'm looking for different ways to improve my own frame of reference uh, for athletic expression, artistic expression, and different ways of communicating. Now, ostensibly, if we look at the classical repertoire, it's a lot like looking at a sport like gymnastics, you know, tumbling. There is a finite vocabulary of skills, although you know it, it, it can expand every now and then that we get a, a freak athlete. Uh, so we've added a technique, but by and large, it's, it's a, it's a set pattern of movements, all of which are, you know, complicated and wonderful. And even though there's a more or less a finite vocabulary, how many different ways are there of teaching those skills? You know, as, as many as there are coaches, or there could be as many as there are coaches, because some coaches are obviously just replicating what they've been exposed to they're not really thinking about developing their own uh variations of the vocabulary so when i watch these videos of these world-class musicians they're basically sharing the the different types of approaches and lessons that, that they were exposed to so that when you're taking all of this in sort of holistically you're getting the wisdom of just centuries of experience from a very high level and I, I would say to any athlete who has aspirations of coaching or any coach who might be listening that one of the most effective things you can do to increase your own effectiveness is to constantly 
build your vocabulary, to add to the ways that you can express and instruct. So, well, that's very at the end of that sermon. That's no, that's very, it's very interesting. It's, it's a lot the way, a lot like the way I look at the world. I don't look at the world as separate into uh, gymnastics and then this industry here and this industry over there and everyone has their own rules. I look at it, like you said, holistically where I want to know everything about everything. And the funny part that really goes with what you're saying is that I've learned more about gymnastics and how to coach and trampoline and tumbling and just how to do the skills as well as how to coach them better by not looking at my industry. I'm 99% of the information I use when I'm thinking about how to coach. I'm using it from quantum physics. I'm using it from quantum loop gravity theory. I'm using it from what I heard some psychologists say in a lecture series at Yale all about the growth of economics and behavioral economics. I'm learning more about that stuff where if I look at my industry, I just I tend to see the same stuff. It's just here's a new drill for handstand. Here's a new drill for this. And it's like, okay, guys, maybe we can, uh, like you said, change up the conversation, try to talk about new topics, and that will hopefully spark a new type of thinking that will come up with a new type of pro uh, solving some kind of problem. And I think we need to really push forward on that as an industry, at least in the gymnastics world from what I see. That's a, a great way of explaining, I think, a very important idea. And ultimately, when you're able to draw from disparate disciplines, you gave some really good examples of that. Uh, I always say that you know, the truth is the truth. And it doesn't exist in one small box called, you know, softball or tennis or gymnastics. You know, the, the way that the mind works, the way the bodies work, you know, the way that we learn how to do complex things uh, are much bigger than any one of those boxes. So the way to get really artful at communicating as a coach uh, or as interpreting as an athlete is to really expand uh, the different models uh, that there are for teaching learning, uh, the different models that there are for sort of conceptualizing craft or athletics. And the more that you can do that and see, when, when you decide to willfully uh, embrace a more holistic, you know, sometimes I, I hate that word, but it basically sums up what we're talking about, uh, approach to living or learning, uh, you'll start to see the commonalities. If you decide to live only within the box of your own individual sport, you're cutting yourself off from so much good information. Now, not all of the information will be good, but the more that you attempt to develop a discerning mind, uh, the better you'll be at filtering out the things that won't be helpful for either you as a competitor or you as a coach. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, uh, I see the industry getting more technical, more pinpointed information, and I personally think that's basically the wrong direction, that we need to do a 180 and go the other way and say, let, let me learn from other sports. Let me learn what soccer players did. Like We're using that already for just a quick example. So the soccer, uh, football in Europe, soccer in North America, um, they have the athletes all line up, and they bring out like a junior, like a, a little kid that comes out and they stand beside them and that's their mentorship program. That's one of the ways they market out the branding, which I haven't seen gymnastics do very effectively, but we're using that in our freestyle association competitions and we're launching that program and it's our mentorship program, but we didn't get that from looking at gymnastics. We got that from looking outside of gymnastics, almost like the more you look at the thing that you have, the less you can see what other people would see. And I think that's a very big problem in gymnastics. We need to look at everyone else and say, well, what's the commonality between how rally racing b began its start and it versus how did equestrian start? What's snowboarding? Why did snowboarding and skiing have an issue? Is there a parallel between parkour and traditional gymnastics? Which of course there is, you know, but that I think is where we're going to get more information to help our sport. Not not just micromanaging our sport and every little flexion and extension and this, that, and the other. I, I think it's the other way. It's learn from other sports instead. I agree with that. I had an interesting experience a couple of years ago. It was uh, May of 2018. I was speaking to an event 
in Las Vegas. It was made up of uh, gym owners, and we're talking gymnastics clubs. And my topic was the physical development or, or strength enhancement. I, I think I my presentation had a more artful. It was like designing athletic destiny or something like that. I was trying to make it sound <laughs> impressive nice and name. also vague <laughs> enough that that they wouldn't uh, just you know kind of blow me off. Because if, if you want to see a lot of opinions in a room, you know, get a whole bunch of gymnastics coaches, particularly ones that are successful. So uh, I was about halfway through the presentation, Greg, and I asked a hypothetical question. I just said, okay, show of hands. Um, how many of you would like your, your athletes uh, to be stronger? You know, they all raise their hands. Uh, how many of you agree that uh, you know strength is important for success uh, in gymnastics? And they'll raise their hands. And I said, how many of you here have examined at any time how the strongest athletes in the world train? Know anything about that? You mean like powerlifting yeah. or functional t- training? I, or- I just I just said. I said strongest because that's a little bit more open to interpretation because we can, we can argue who the strongest athletes are. Right. I get your point. Yeah. You, know, you, you can sort of, yeah. So what they say? So I said, okay, uh, no, another question. Okay. How many of you feel it would be beneficial for your athletes to, to have greater speed? You know, I'm talking running speed. So, you know, we're, we're coming to the vault table or we're just about to, uh, you know, do a, a, a tumbling series during a floor routine. Uh, would you like your athletes to be faster? No, yeah, raise your hands. Okay. Again, how many of you have examined the training methods of the world's fastest athletes? How do they get that, that way? What lessons can we take from that? And it was basically, uh, you know, to sort of launch into, uh, because then I started talking about how the strongest athletes in the world train and how it's different than most conventional uh gymnastics conditioning protocols and the same thing with speed what is it that you know makes makes a body fast or those types of things and gymnastics is not the only sport it's it's a relatable topic for your audience but many sports have tremendous amounts of well-established training dogma and certain sports are notorious for not looking at anything other than their sport Even though uh, the athletes at the highest levels of those sports generate lots of income and, you know, are competing in a very technologically advanced uh, setting. You know, if we look at golf, if we look at boxing, they might even be more uh, at fault, we'll say, uh, which is a pejorative term, uh, than, we'll say, gymnastics, just in terms of a religious adherence to antiquated training methods. Now I'll, I'll just say it. Uh, hmm. And they'll justify it by saying, well, no one understands golf, but golfers, you know, people you know, trying to come in from the outside. They just don't understand us. Okay. Now, because there was a real lull in his performance and he, sort of fell out of public favor. But if we look at Tiger Woods, we'll, we'll step away from uh, the tumbling realm for a moment. Tiger Woods was the first golfer to embrace resistance training. Did it make him muscle bound? Did it make him slower? Or did it allow him to drive that ball so much further than his competitors at the time that they literally thought he was a superhuman? Huh, I didn't know that. It was that. Yeah. And <laughs> he was also, at the age of 13, uh, being uh, visited on a recurring basis by a sports hypnotist. Something that his father, a former special forces soldier in the Vietnam era, hmm, there's, a, there's an interesting corollary, huh. uh, thought might be helpful to young Tiger. Now, and I, I actually use... Uh, Two athlete specific examples, well, okay, technically three in my book, Mind Boss. I quote Dan Gable, but uh, from an athletic performance perspective, I contrast uh, Lance Armstrong and Tiger Woods. And I talk about Tiger Woods because when he had his very public, we'll say, meltdown 
when all of his uh, personal indiscretions came to light in a hurry, what did we see about what had been the most dominant and most consistently dominant athlete in any sport up to that point? He disintegrated. And he went years having a career that many people said, it's over. Just give it up. You're embarrassing yourself. You know, certainly you don't have to keep playing for money. But eventually he was able to uh, sort of figure himself out. And even though he's in an advanced age for a professional golfer, he has he's come back. But he needed time to sort himself out. So you can be an extremely uh, successful athlete physically, mentally, uh, and you can still lose that. Yeah, it can still be susceptible to uh, to doubt and, and all of those other things that can creep into an athlete's mind and deteriorate their performance, even if you used to be the best in the world. So I think there's there's some interesting lessons there, meaning that um, it's all masterable. It's also all unmasterable, and it takes uh, consistent work. Which, which is an interesting thing as it relates to uh, mental training uh, because most people don't approach mental training uh, with a, a plan in place to do it on a consistent basis. Mental training, unfortunately, uh, is often regarded as something that you need to do if there's a problem. Oh, we've got a performance issue. Uh, this kid's got some kind of mental block. Let's go get that fixed. And as soon as it's fixed, we don't think about the thing that just fixed it anymore we're, we're back to doing what we've always done so uh that that almost is a, a separate set of uh, questions but with respect to uh, what it takes to to be really good if, if we look at the example of tiger woods at his prime what we have is an athlete who like you were talking about initially trained way outside the box and was open to wisdom and ideas from other areas. And he also trained out of the box, we're talking just on the physical side, uh, when he was lifting weights, every expert in the sport was talking about why this was a bad idea. Oh, he's just, he's just puffing himself up. You don't need those muscles. It's golf. <laughs> And then he basically built himself into this golf Superman you know, from a physical perspective. And that was uh, combined with at the, at the time, you know, before things started uh, falling apart, uh, he was m- mentally strong, you know, at, at a high level. He'd been cultivating uh, practice strategies for his mind since he was in middle school. That's a pretty powerful combination. Jesus. So, the, up, the upside there is, you know, if we do look outside, you know, as, as you described, uh, we can use those lessons, become very successful. But even so, uh, we have to stay on top of ourselves. You know, if you can be the most perfect machine in a sport, I you like Tiger Woods, but if you don't maintain the machine, if you start, you know, focusing on you know, impulsive recreational uh, opportunities or behavior, uh, performance suffers. Yep, it's true. You got you to gotta maintain a lot of, it's almost like social media, actually. You just had this discussion with some influencers the other day, and they, you know, they, the kids think that they'll get the one viral video and life is complete. They don't realize that you have to maintain and get a, a few million views every few months or so on some kind of new project or you're not going to make a name for yourself. So you got to, once you get to the top, everyone is there trying to now knock you off. So yeah, you getting there is half the battle, staying there is the rest. Exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a good analogy you know, because I, I think social media is emblematic of, of sort of how we, we approach things now. You know, success can happen very quickly, but it can disappear even faster than it ever had in the past. You know, the idea of, of brand loyalty and things, those are almost antiquated notions. You know, who's doing something cool right now? And 
you know, that's a, that's a difficult pace to maintain. You have to really want it. And that that's almost akin to an athlete's mindset. You know, if, if you want to be as good as you can be, that's not just a lot of hard work this week. And then next week is easy. Yeah. It's hard week forever. It's hard work forever. No. And, and that's the thing. And I think like you said, it starts at the beginning. You have to get yourself into a mind state at the very beginning of your career as fast as humanly possible and maintain that sort of program, you know, and I, that's where the motivation for me, every time I went to training, I would always listen to the same sort of CD that had all the same songs, all motivational stuff, and I would plan my day out. And at the end of the training, I would listen, watch all my videos on the way home and then plan the next day. And that was literally my routine for 15, 20 years of training. And, but you always have to do it. I, it's not like I waited until a, I had a good day and then thought about what I was doing. I, I had to put myself into that motivational position. And that gets me to a very interesting question. I believe that motivation really is fear, fear of failing. So how do you look at motivation versus fear? Are they the same thing, opposite sides of the coin? Or do you think, what do, what do you think pushes athletes? Is it the motivation to do better or the fear of failing? Okay, great question. Uh, motivation is uh, such a catch-all term in athletics. And uh, I, there, there are so many uh, opportunities to think we're talking about the same thing and we're not, which I think is sort of what your question is driving at. Um, I was, uh, I'm a bit of a contrarian when it comes to a lot of things, especially when it comes to things like confidence and motivation. So I'll start to uh, deconstruct motivation uh, in, in my uh, interpretation starting right now. And I'll use an example. The other day I was, uh, on my uh, Facebook feed, I saw a, uh, a post by a, a big-time gymnastics influencer, and he's got a, a pretty cool podcast, and he was uh, he had just posted uh, the podcast, and it was, his guest was a former Olympian and, and current you know, club owner slash coach. And there was a list of questions that people wrote in the comments section while the, the podcast was live. And one of the questions, I'll paraphrase it, uh, was essentially, uh, what do you recommend for kids who aren't motivated? Another and sport. <laughs> I thought, th this is such a great question because it's the wrong question. You know, yeah. It's based on a wrong premise or an incorrect premise. Um, the idea that it's the coach's job to motivate an athlete. I disagree with that vehemently. Now, it is the coach's job to keep things interesting and rewarding, uh, particularly in, in a sport where some, you know, as you get really good, progress slows way down. It becomes very, very more, much more uh, incremental. But if I'm answering that question, if I'm the club owner, Okay, if, if you're looking at me as an athlete and you just don't feel this, you don't feel like gymnastics, make room for other kids that do. Find something else that you love. If you don't love this, find something else. My job is not to make you love gymnastics. That's gymnastics' job. It's so inherently interesting and challenging and complicated. It's all of the things that we know it to be. And if that moves you, great, we have a lot to talk about. If it doesn't move you, then why are we wasting our collective time? Ooh, now I'm this... not here to... I'm not interested in... Uh, it's, it's kind of like analogous in a sense to a romantic relationship. You know, It's not your job to convince someone to fall in love with you. Okay, They either are drawn to your attributes, your character... You know, all of the things that make you you, or they're not. You know, if somebody has to be sold on gymnastics, that's going to wear off quickly. And we see that a lot in gyms. You know, we see kids who really don't want to be there, but, you know, they've got a parent who it's almost like the parent's dream. And we see that in every sport. That's not unique to gymnastics, of course. We see it in art. We see it in, you know, music. 
You know, we see a lot of kids who are putting in reps that really don't want to be there. And now that's different than, you know, any kid who's in gymnastics is going to go through a bit of a dry spell where, man, this really feels like a grind. Maybe they're they're feeling really beat up. Uh, maybe that next skill is coming slow. That's different than I don't want to be in the gym. I'm just, you know, I don't like gymnastics, uh, which is typically diagnosed as this kid's not motivated. Well, I He's got to find what they're motivated for. As something that can be uh, superimposed by a third party. You either want to do the thing or you don't. Well, that's so very, it's very interesting. That's how we look at motivation, which I think is different than your original question. No, that, no that's okay. That's because I, and this is great because I totally don't agree with you, which is awesome because for, for me, a coach's job is the motivation because the biomechanics is so easy when you break it down and peel away the communication and peel away the capitalistic structure of sport in general and all these other things. When you actually break it all down, it's just purely robots moving one degree at a time depending on where they want to go. So for me, there's no reason anyone should ever want to do sports at the start anyway, really. It's more about all these other things that people kind of feel that they are falling in love with the sport but they're misassociating it right for and i'll give you a perfect example i i did gymnastics for forever um ever since i was like five years old and i i told myself oh i love gymnastics and everyone asked me do you like gymnastics of course i love gymnastics why else would i be doing it kind of felt self-fulfilling prophecy in some sense and but then what happened was that my gym shut down because they made no money as many gyms don't make that much money and um, we had to move to a new gym, and what happened really quickly is I realized that I wasn't there because I loved gymnastics. I was there because I loved my friends. I loved training with them. I loved being with them. The inherent movement, if you want to get really philosophical here, and the movement of one shoulder flexion to another or a high bar really did nothing for me at the end of the day. But when I got off of the high bar, it was the coach that I could banter with. It was the athletes that I got to make uh, jokes with, and we had to do sleepovers and stuff like that and travel together and hang out and uh, drink at the hotel rooms after competitions. That was my motivation, not gymnastics. And I would argue that if I put any athlete on a uh, like a lie detector test and ask some very pointed questions, and you know, had someone like Paul Ekman or you know, facial recognition masters and people like that, and know the psychology that 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 it's superficial. The sport itself is superficial, and the coach has to dig underneath that superficial sport and be able to find the thing that makes a biological creature move. In one direction. Well, what makes you move in a direction? Oh, rewards, punishments. That's that's Skinner 101. And we like to put ourselves above that basic binary sort of reality. But personally, I haven't seen any evidence to uh, say that that would make any sense to put yourself on that pedestal. I think we're just on and off switches saying, well, if I like this because it's good for me, I'm going to get more of it. And I think people misassociate and they generalize the thing called sport. But really, when you break it down, every athlete's actually there for not the sport. It's for something else that they're getting out of the sport that's a little bit nuanced. And that would be my argument, that a coach is really there to give that motivation, figure out what are you really here for? Because it ain't because you care if your uh, lump of molecules called your body can do a 360 degree backflip with a 180 degree turn so that people can clap. You're there because you want them to clap or you're there because of the the friends or this or that. So I would say that that actually I, I would disagree with you, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, my thoughts are actually, I don't think from a functional perspective, that different than the example that you just painted. Because when uh, we look at, we'll say gymnastics, gymnastics isn't just gymnastics. Gymnastics is also everything else that you talked about. The the collective experience, all of those things. It's, you know, every Saturday morning before practice starts, we do a fun warm up instead of our regular warm up. Uh, the things that we do are our contest rituals when we're on the road, you know, the pizza party at the hotel, whatever it is. Beer, beer, beer. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's also gymnastics. So when I talk about it's not the coach's job to to make you love the sport, I'm not talking solely about the sport in isolation. And maybe I could have uh, clarified that a bit more. 
it is a collective experience, you know, set of experiences. It is the relationship with the coaches. It is the relationship with the teammates. It's ultimately, uh, so if, if I was going to rephrase the, uh, it's not the coach's job to make the athlete love gymnastics. It is the coach's job to create a culture within their universe, within that gym, where this is interesting. This is rewarding. And yes, this is fun. But also recognizing that there are kids in sort of a a, a spectrum of appreciativeness, meaning that some kids, oftentimes it's the naturals, you know, it's less about the gymnastics and more about who they're doing gymnastics with. But for some kids, it's also becoming really amazing at something, you know, and they derive uh, some level of, of meaning, some some level of, of social benefit from that, you know, whether it's the the medals we accumulate in our bedroom, or we like the applause, or n- no pizza tastes better than pizza at a hotel when you're on the road with with your friends. It is a, a process of creating a, an environment. But I'm assuming that if you create that environment, you're still going to have kids that don't want to be in that environment. Oh, yeah, of course. You're and not going to get them all. I don't, th- I don't think it's the coach's job to try to fix that. Okay, so you're talking about so, the, the, that, that percent of kids that really just aren't there for the right reasons. Mom and dad yeah. might have put them in there. They, they might rather be a piano class, you know, and learning Chopin. Yeah. But yeah. They, you can't, you know, you're not supposed yeah. to try so to pull them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't care why you love gymnastics. If it's gymnastics for gymnastics sake or it's gymnastics because you just happen to have one of those coaches who's so awesome that you always want to be around them and you want to be in that setting. Now, is that purely a gymnastics thing or is that a creativity and charisma factor on the part of the coach? Well, you can't really separate any of those things out. You can't isolate each you know, constituent ingredient. But whatever it is that makes that meaningful, enjoyable for you, uh, that's great. But if you have an athlete that's not responding to that, and so that's sort of where I was was going with your question. I don't believe that is a failing on the part of the coach. And oftentimes I think coaches take that on, you know, well, I've got 80% of my athletes who love being here, and I've got 20% who don't, or maybe you know, it's 5% who don't. What's wrong with me? Nothing. That's a pretty good ratio. I was going to say, yeah. That's yeah. not bad at all. This isn't, this isn't for everybody. This sport can kill you. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's well. I think it sounds like we actually are uh, saying the same thing, just in two different ways. So it's 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 interesting to hear your different perspective. Like you're saying earlier, you know, everyone has a unique sort of way of translating, and communicating. By even hearing it from somebody else, you can realize that maybe you weren't so off base. It just you guys have different ways of saying it. And my coach used to get so mad at me at this. You know, I remember one time we would go to another gym because, again, the gym was kind of broke. And we would go to a gym that actually could afford to have an in-ground pit. And we would do all our new ring dismounts yeah. into into there. And I remember my one coach who it became actually um, – a long-term coach, Titus, and he uh, goes to me while I'm on rings and I'm bending my legs and he says, Greg, why don't you just straighten your legs? And I'm like, oh, really? Straight Like this? And then I, all of a sudden I straighten my legs because he said it. And my coach is over there just like, what the uh-huh. hell, man? I've been saying this to you for years, <laughs> right? And he just, he, he was so pissed, right? But not in a bad way. He was just frustrated. He's like, Craig, what the hell, man? You know, yeah. and, and that's, and I, and this, I think this is another perfect example of that. And again, it goes right back to the idea that learn to hear different people's opinions in different industries. You'll be a little bit more open to the idea that you won't say it the same way. And I, I know there's people that really struggle with that concept. They need to hear it a certain way or they think think the other person's automatically their enemy and i don't think that's the case you know i think that's a really good example of uh, communication and just um but it's communication where it's not my coach's fault it's not it wasn't doran's fault that i didn't listen to him it wasn't that he didn't motivate me or he was one of the best coaches out there Mm -hmm. but it was just the fact it came from a different avenue so it made a different pathway in my brain that it could click you know Absolutely. Well, and the other thing, too, is there there's oftentimes an assumption that if I say something to you, you get it right away. Now, 
you do because you're a smart guy. But let's say that you're a regular guy. And uh, oftentimes you have to hear the same thing over a period of time before it starts to penetrate. And maybe it was the way the other coach said it. Maybe it was that plus the fact that you were just ready to hear it or you were ready to sort of implement it. You had finally figured out the more complicated top half of that skill and uh, the more detailed stuff like what you were doing with your legs. Okay, now maybe you're ready to you know, simultaneously handle all of those inputs at one time. Very or it could true, yeah. be something else entirely. So it's uh, communication is not, and I like that you pointed out, it wasn't a, a deficiency on the part of your coach, but it's also dependent on the receiver of the information. And that's where I think a, a lot of us get frustrated. Yeah, I agree. We can be very artful, but is the person that we're communicating with, are they ready to hear it? You know, uh, what else is going on? Are we managing the environment in such a way that we're making it easier for them to hear? There's there's a lot of, of nuance associated with that. Yeah, there really there really are. And that's, again, what, back to the start is why um, I really believe that communication is really the, the big missing piece in a lot of sports, not just gymnastics, but a lot of coaches, they just... They, they look at the athlete like they look at themselves and as if they're talking to themselves in the mirror, you know, and say, well, if I just say it this way, they must get it. But in reality, it's in one ear out the other, not because the coach is an idiot or the kid is not motivated. It's just you guys are speaking almost two different languages and one could be called young kid language and the other one could be called old, dried up, has been, now I'm only a coach language, you know what I mean? And you could you could have like a, this just, it's, it's like French and English. You, you have have to translate it somewhere in the middle and I that's much harder than teaching someone how to do a giant on high bar if they just magically listen to you is getting the athlete to want to listen to the instructions whether it's from you or from somebody else and that to me is really the art of coaching not the skills those are easy by comparison yeah I, I agree with that I had an interesting uh, conversation a couple years ago at a USAG camp uh, with uh, a coach from the University of Nebraska. And they're, they're typically in the top 10 uh, at the end of the season each year. So they're pretty good. And uh, we were talking about how he has this uh, thing that he does. It's a very simple thing. It may, may be more common than I realized. But uh, he'll ask athletes, you know, on a particular skill, um, do you see yourself in space? I mean, you know, do you see the ceiling? Do you see the floor? Or do you feel it? And from there, he'll start trying to adjust his language to more sort of sensory terms or visual terms. For example, you know, look for this or feel your feet or, you know, whatever it might make the most sense. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a context dependent on, on in terms of the skill, but just trying to figure out how, uh, like when, when I'm, trying to figure things out myself, I usually use terms uh, that are sort of kinesthetic. Well, let, let me feel what that's like. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch on that. I'm getting, So I, I sort of phrase things a certain way because that's, you have to show me stuff as opposed to some people, if you describe something to them, they've got it. If you show them visually, they've got it. You know, of course, there's also people who are sort of, you know, somewhere in the middle. But people tend to be predisposed, you know, one way or another, just in terms of how they conceptualize information. You know, is it a kinesthetic thing? Is it an audio thing? Is it a visual thing? And for some, that's kind of an oversimplification. But if you can figure out uh, what the athlete most responds to and you can feed them that, you know, it's just a, a minor example of how we start to streamline the communication process. Well, and I, I think part of the reason, and first of all, that's a really good example. I actually never thought of that. So that's really, really cool. Something to think about for sure. But I think it's uh, a lot of people don't realize that personally, like people say, oh, well, I put myself in your shoes and all this sort of stuff. And they make it sound like it's a nice thing. And they say things like, well, mirror neurons help, uh, you know, light up when I lift my hand. And when you lift your hand, my neuro- mirror neurons go off, you know, all this, these ways that we try to tell ourselves that we're like other people and can communicate. But I think there's naturally going to always be a gap through experiences. And I think that some coaches really just don't 
don't think that that actually plays a factor. And I personally, I don't know, tell me what you think, but I personally don't think that humans are capable of really putting themselves in another person's shoe. I think we say this, but I don't think we ever could because you could never have those same experiences. So you're always just guessing and rounding up or down, you know, and assuming. And I think that that just causes problems that it's like almost like a paradox. As we try to bridge the gap, we actually almost make more of a gap sometimes. You know what I mean? That we're getting into a really interesting area. Uh, it, it can get very complicated. The, uh, the way that I was introduced to some of those paradoxes you described was back when I was a police officer. And, you know, when we were being initially taught, you know, there, there was a lot of lip service given to this idea of, you know, putting yourself uh, in, in the shoes of someone else, you know, trying to see the world the way they see it can't be done. Uh, they are you're, you're talking to them because they don't see the world the way cops see the world. You're talking to them because they look at the world the way, you know, people who are decisionally challenged or behaviorally challenged uh, <laughs> to be more charitable nice. see it. But what you can do is empathize in, in terms of, okay, I don't understand this person, but I can probably understand what's important to them right now. You know, and if there's something that's bothering them to the extent that they're potentially going to commit some act that would necessitate them going to jail, obviously they feel that whatever is important to them right now, that is an unmet need. It's something that's not happening satisfactorily. Okay. So can I at least try to figure out what that thing is? So at least we're talking about the same thing. Um, because to use a, a very simple example, if, I'm a police officer and I show up at a bar because a couple of people are potentially uh, going to be fighting in the next few seconds. Um, I'll, I'll say things like, hey, calm down, because what does a rational person want? Calm, quiet. Well, but what do irrational people want? Well, they want different things than that. They want the excitement. They want the, the emotional catharsis of punching someone else in the face. They have coping mechanisms that are perhaps less sophisticated than the average person. Now, you can't put yourself in the head of someone like that, but you can at least understand what might be important to them in the moment, which might simply be a feeling of control over themselves. Now, if they're not sophisticated, the way they experience control might be by beating other people up. Well, that's, that's not going to be an exceptional or acceptable outcome. So we have to at least you know, try to reach them in terms of giving them something that might make them feel some level of control over themselves and their immediate circumstances. So maybe we can, we can solve this without taking people to jail. Now, that's, that's a really different sort of example than the athletic context. But in terms of understanding people, uh, I think it's less about trying to imagine what it is to be that person and just trying to get a handle on what's meaningful for them. You know, and I think that's what relates to, you know, coach and athlete communications. You know, we're talking about what it was specifically about gymnastics that make us love it. Well, if the coach understands that, you know, Tommy is really all about gymnastics, you know, he wants to technically be an excellent gymnast. So I understand that that's important to him. OK, if I'm talking to Mark, well, I know that Mark, hey, he's a hard worker, he's a talented kid. But what he's really interested in is just being in the gym and enjoying the gym experience. So I'm going to talk to him uh, in, in terms that reflect a sensitivity to what his priorities are. If that makes sense. Makes complete sense. And, uh, you know, it's something you learn in psychology 101 or at least clinical therapy is that when someone's having a panic attack, the least the last thing you tell them is calm down because now you're just basically putting them up onto a pedestal saying there's something wrong with you, you know, and it's it's very easy you hear it all the time in uh, in movies and just regular day to day. Oh, calm down, calm down. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, because and that's a perfect example yeah. of where you're not putting your irrational brain on trying to 
map out what it would be like if you did want to punch someone. I think it's more about telling yourself, okay, well, this is the environment. If we're in uh, the bar fight, then I need to put myself in an environment in my mind that says, when's the last time I wanted to punch somebody in the face? And what did I do to calm myself down about that? And that's a whole different question than trying to come in and say, yeah, well, you'll go to jail if you do it, or you'll you'll get in trouble with this, because that's the logical side. That's the cortex. That's not where that behavior is actually stemming from. That's bypassing the cortex and going straight to the amygdala and the thalamus and all these kind of more, uh, let's say, deeper centers of the brain. And I think people forget that that's where most of behaviors come from is subconsciously from your past and all that sort of stuff. So we need to almost talk to the thalamus, the hind brain, the, you know, the back parts of the brain more than the front part, you know, and I think people, that's a basic neuroanatomy that people really can use without getting into all the nitty gritty details. Yeah, it's, uh, again, under, understanding what, uh, you know, to simplify it, you know, it's, it's understanding what works and what doesn't work. Um, and that sort of comes with time in the trenches, you know, whether you're a cop or you're a coach, uh, you'll definitely learn quickly what doesn't work yeah. if you're paying attention. Uh, but that that's a key piece. Um, you can uh, you can not pay attention and you can continue to try to apply less effective means. And unfortunately, you do see that in coaching because yeah. a lot of coaches coach on the assumption that, well, I'm the coach. Everyone's listening. And, you know, it's their job to listen. Well, it's it's your job to be understood. So there's, you know, there a, a duality present in that process. But if you are someone who is constantly paying attention and trying you know, to learn how to do things better, your your time putting in those those cueing reps, and, you know, those verbal reps, you know, is time well spent. And you can generally tell uh, a more experienced coach from from a newer coach. They just have a deeper reservoir of uh, of verbal strategies, communication strategies, yep. and that's just because they've they've had the opportunity to develop it. Yep, and just years and also too to understand what it is to go from athlete to coach. You know, different yeah. language, uh, d- different role. Yeah, that definitely takes a bit of time. For me, when I first started coaching, I was like 11 years old and everyone just comes to coaching training and that's just how kind of you paid the bills, at least at the start. And I always thought of it as I got to teach the athlete how to do it or I'm a crappy coach. It's all about getting skill acquisition, skill acquisition, mom and dad are watching. If I can't get them to do the back handspring, they're going to think I suck and I'm going to get fired. And that was literally the extent of it. So I went from point A to point B as fast as possible to make sure that, um, you know, I look like what I perceived at 11 years old as what being a good coach meant. But the reality is I've, I've grown up and realized what good coaching is. It's more about giving people that time and attention that they need for whatever it is that they're really there for and a lot more of my time is spent trying to figure out what they're there for than the actual skill itself. That's a great point. And I also think it, uh, it points to one of the, the difficulties for coaches when they don't uh, coach the way they, they know they should or the way they want to when they're coaching for an audience. You know, when we start coaching for parents, uh, we start worrying about, well, I'm going to, I need to keep teaching new skills. I got to keep making this interesting for the kid. And I keep need to demonstrate value to the parents as opposed to drilling something until we, we get it right. Because that doesn't look like progress. That doesn't look like you're getting your money's worth. So I I think think also too, there is a, uh, you have to develop a certain sense of, uh, self-belief as a coach. You know, which, of, of course, you know, everyone likes to use cliches such as trust the process. Well, that's great, but you have to have a process to trust. So yeah. if you have that, you know, then then lean on that and, and coach the way that, that you know that you should rather than worrying about pleasing the gallery, which yeah. I think is, is, is something that a lot of coaches fall into just because of, you know, kind of how they view the uh, – the coach customer relationship. Yeah. 
I agree. And it's, it's tough because as a kid, when you're young, you know that fundamentally your job is on the line and the parents come in with their preconceived notions of who's going to be an Olympian and their kids awesome, of course, because it came from their DNA. So God knows they're going to be amazing. And the only reason I'm not Olympian is because of the fact that, you know, some other circumstance is not of my control, but my kid, you know, you hear all the way these people do this. Right, then, they, right. then they get into the gym and then the gym owner just wants money at the end of the day. Of course, they want, you know, good success and they want a good atmosphere like you said but at the end of the day you got to pay the bills so that is the prime target at the end of the day or every gym club would be purely non-profit which it's not so now you have them kind of reinforcing the the biases that the parents already have come in with that they've already given to the kid as well at home before the kid got there too then the kid goes inside and sees all these medals on the wall because of course it's all marketing and then says oh and then they're told indirectly that well to get a medal then you're valuable to us so to get a medal you have to learn a flip as fast as possible and it just becomes part of the system and not to say it's bad but it's 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 like that with every capitalistic structure and uh, and every you know philosopher you know talks about how bad that is but at the same time you need that structure so i don't think it's a bad thing but it's easy for coaches to uh, lean purely on the capitalistic educational mind state, you know, the teach to test, get from point A to point B as fast as possible without really exploring the landscape and realizing what the possibilities actually are. They're just looking for that next medal. And I think this is a very bad way to sort of push kids. I think it should be the first couple of years you're not even allowed to compete. You can only play. You can only have fun. You can only build a passion for the sport. And then I can narrow in if you decide that you want to win some medals after the fact. Never start with the medals. And that's that's something I see a lot, and I, I don't like it. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate those points. And one thing I, I do see as a positive development in the gym universe is multiple tracks uh, for training. So... You know, kids who just want to play and explore have a, a vehicle for that, and uh, it's its own sort of terminal objective. And then kids who might want to tr- transition into a competitive context are looked at not just in terms of physical attributes, but are they going to be kids who will find success in, in a competitive setting? Because not every kid is wired for that. It's it's tough. And, you know, do we want to take this kid who's loving just the activity and and make them overly concerned and, and fretful and have a completely different association with, with that activity? Now some some kids absolutely, you know, they're they're ruthless competitors, man. Bring it on, they can handle it. They love it. But that's not every kid. That's not most kids. So what I see now uh, in many cases are gyms where admission to the team is not just physical competency. It's also sort of emotional resistance and, you know, determining suitability for the rigors mentally of that activity. And I, and I think that's awesome. I think that that's really healthy yeah. so that everybody has a means to engage with the activity in a way that makes sense for who they are and what they want. But you can develop that mental because you talking about how you really need to start at the beginning with that. So if you were going to work with a, a group and you were going to start working with them right now, what would be one of the first few little exercises or strategies that you would use to help make sure that they compare to group B, you know, they're more mentally tough? What would you do? Um, well, ass- assuming that they're of a certain age – uh, and assuming that everybody was on board, I would first talk to them, uh, just talk to them about how the mind typically works, how the mind wants to help its owner, but the mind, if it's untrained, doesn't always know the, the most pleasant way to do that. Uh, your mind can tell you some pretty harsh things, and it's not because you're a negative person. Uh, it's just that, uh, that's how the, how the mind operates because it's always using, you know, extreme strong problem solving language. So it brings that, that sort of bluntness to, uh, to every internal exchange. So we talk a little bit about that 
and we talk a little bit about how we see things. And I'll typically assign an activity, and this is, even though it might sound a little cute, uh, I make it sound cute if the audience is younger. I don't make it sound cute at all if they are college-age wrestlers. I kind of frame it a little bit differently, but the activity is much the same. I talk about how the mind is constantly scanning the, the world, the immediate environment, for problems to solve. And in an absence of problems, it just kind of keeps you on a war footing. It keeps you a little bit paranoid. And that's not a a comfortable place to be. And I talk about the mind uh, being a sort of a pattern-seeking mechanism. You know, we we look for commonalities. It's how we organize data. It's how we uh, store away lessons learned. Uh, It's one of the reasons why metaphor is such a a powerful uh, learning tool. It's because uh, the mind operates best when it can, can connect dots okay it's why stories if they're good uh, can be so helpful because it's really the way that the brain processes information you know beginning middle end that type of thing as opposed to just random data that's very hard for the mind to store so we talk about those things we do it in a uh, age appropriate context and then i assign inevitably one of my first activities which is to take inventory at the end of the day Every day. It has to be every day. If you don't do it every day, you don't get the result. If you don't do it every day, you're missing out on a great opportunity to practice a few minutes of discipline. And what you do is you think about your day and you think about five things that happened during the day that you feel good about. Now, these are things that you had something to do with. So if today it was a sunny day and you liked that, you can't, you can't journal that. You can't write that down because you're not in charge of the weather okay that's someone else's job so five different things that happen over the course of the day that you feel good about that you had something to do with whether that was you know waking up on time and getting off to school on time because maybe that's a challenge for you uh maybe it had something to do with what happened at practice maybe two things happened at practice you you know and maybe one of the and was not that specific. Maybe you just worked really hard during conditioning today. And what we do over time is we start uh, recalibrating the way our mind is scanning the environment. We go from scanning for perpetual problems to solve to focusing on things that are more pleasant to think about. Because at the end of the day, if I said, okay, what are five things that happened today that you feel good about? That's going to take a little bit of concentration to try to recall. If I say, okay, it's the end of the day. Give me five things that happened today that pissed you off. You'll have those five things in a few seconds. That's easy. Yeah. Some of those things you'll remember a year from now. (laughs) Yeah. So we, it's, it's very easy uh, to recall things that we're not happy about things that made us angry, things that made us scared. Negative emotion is very easy to access. Positive associations are less so unless we train ourselves for it. And what we ultimately do is uh, over time we reprogram something called uh, the RAS. uh, And uh, it it gets kind of uh, complicated. But uh, reticular activation system, which just sort of refers to how our, our mind is calibrated at any given time. Okay. And most of us are on our, the default setting of, we were born with most people don't think about these things as being editable but they are it just takes work and it's consistent work you can't do it a couple times one week and a couple times the next week but it only takes a few minutes a day if you can remember to do it every day so you know i have some athletes that i've worked with that literally have several years worth of journals with these five things every day at the end of the day that uh, they feel good about that ultimately starts transforming the way that they they process things. Now, the great thing about this exercise is when you've had a really crappy day because you have to do some extensive digging to come up with five things that you can feel good about because we know that uh, having a bad day is sort of a – it has a contagious effect on one circumstance to the next. And it's a, it's a domino effect many times. 
So if you can dig out five things on your really challenging days, uh, you're doing some very amazing and important work. And I've had uh, people who I did one workshop with, like one sticks out for me a couple of years ago. I did one 90 minute workshop for a uh, collegiate softball team. One never saw these athletes again. Uh, after about a year, I got an email from one of the athletes thanking me for giving them this quote unquote homework, which she apparently committed to and did every day for about a year. And it was a very long email. It basically changed her life. It made her a better student. It made her a better athlete. It improved her relationships with her family. It was extraordinary. And ultimately, it was a great example of how something extremely simple, and, and many of the great mind exercises are simple. And as such, we tend to overlook them or we think, oh, that's interesting, Mike. Yeah, I'll try that out sometime. Okay, you either will do it or you won't. If you do it, you will get to claim amazing benefits. If you don't, it will be like all the other things that you could be doing, but you decided not to because it's too much hassle or whatever. And yet you think because you process the idea of the exercise intellectually, because I can't tell you about a mental exercise unless I convey it to you within the intellectual domain. Once I've done that, you may think you have it. One of Mike Gillette's most prevalent sayings is, the answer is not the answer. The answer is the application of the answer, which simply means that if you're doing the answer, if you're not applying the strategy, you don't know it. It doesn't matter what you think you understand intellectually. If you haven't confronted the experiential aspect of it, you will never get the reward from it. So yep. that would be the first thing I would do. That's a long answer to a fairly simple question. But let me, but so let I, me... would, I, would frame, I would frame the activity in a way, again, that's sort of you know, age appropriate or activity appropriate. Uh, if you're a precision athlete, like a tumbler, we'll talk about certain things. If you're a combat athlete, you know, I'll make it sound tougher. But ultimately, what we're doing is we are investing time to start to recalibrate the way that we process our environment. And how we process our environment has everything to do with how we manage and navigate our internal environment. Well, no, that's that's interesting. So, it's interesting that you bring that up because remember we were talking earlier about the standing in front of the mirror, and that a psychologist would say that that is uh -huh. what you're doing instead of but instead of fooling yourself into thinking it's an overnight fix by just doing it right before training, you're saying get into that positive mind state by let's say recalibrating, like you said, where it's not just the world's against me. You're comparing and saying, well, no, look at all the good things you are doing. You know, life could be a lot worse. You know, you have a really good life. Anyone that's alive now, uh, not anyone, but most people that are alive now in the third and the first world, you know, has a great life. So all you're doing is starting them off by saying, let's remember how grateful we should be for even having what we have now. Don't just focus on the negatives. Isn't that the same sort of strategy uh, as looking in the mirror and, and kind of tricking yourself into it? Because the research shows that if you look yourself in the mirror and smile, you naturally report higher happiness and stuff like that. So how do you uh, – is that the same thing? Are we talking about two different things? Or are we just miscommunicating? How does – it, it makes sense to think that they're the same thing, but they are not, and, and here's why. Um, and, yeah, absolutely the, you know, the smile – experiments and in, in brain waves that's there, there's nothing uh self-delusional about that but smiling is different than saying something that isn't true uh but with respect to what i'm talking about it's it's easy to misunderstand it as something that sort of in pop culture has been known as like a gratitude journal it's not that the um so if I was assigning this activity, I would explain a few more things. And one of those things would be, uh, you might be tempted to write down things that happen to you that you're happy about. You don't get to write those things down, okay? Uh, if somebody walks up to you and gives you a compliment, unless you earned that compliment, unless it had some factual basis, okay? If somebody just came up, up to you and just said some arbitrary nice thing, Thing. There's nothing wrong with that. We love those moments, but we're not in charge of those moments. And our job is not to search for 
randomly occurring external validation from the universe. The criteria is these are five things that happened throughout the day that you had something to do with. Your effort, your initiative, your creativity led to something happening. You know, and that's why I use the example of maybe one of those things is you just pushed really hard during conditioning today. And maybe the rest of practice was a soup sandwich. You just could not put anything together. But if you really struggled on floor, but you never gave up, you can write that down. You know, that's, that is a fact. That happened. And ultimately, it's not just about re, sort of recalibrating so that we see things from a more positive perspective, which is important. And you point out it is also important to be grateful for how awesome life is right now because it is. But that's a subset of this other thing. And this other thing is learning how what you do changes how you think. What you do changes how your day goes, or it can if you put in the reps. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I just wanted to clarify because I understand, I figured that that would be a question that our audience might be thinking about. But I think you did a good job of navigating that one. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the, the opportunity to uh, expand on that. No, it's, it's good. And we're here, we're tough. We're asking the tougher questions that I know some people really try to stay away from or think that they know, like you said, you know, people think because they read some theory in a book that they all of a sudden they know they're already applying it because they can look back in their memory bank and say, oh, well, there's a time that that kind of thing happened. And they're really just kind of throw They're doing the reverse order rather than, you know, and uh, so I just want to make sure that we're very clear about that because I'm with you. I I'm more of a realist. Life sucks sometimes, but life is great sometimes too. And I say that technically it's generally about a 50-50. Uh, there's usually five good things that happen to you and five bad things that happen to you. But those five bad things are things that, again, you also could have foreseen by now remembering them for tomorrow. And once you start to realize that even these bad moments are actually just – I say things like, you know, it's never a failed attempt. It's just a delayed success or something like that. It's just you're just not there yet. Yet. And yeah. once you get into that mind state, then the life life just gets better all the time. It doesn't get exponentially better overnight, but it always gets better. And every day you wake up a little bit farther than you were last time. And when you're in that mind state, and this is what we teach our athletes, is it's a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You know, instead of the like you said, self talk in the mirror, which really instead of doing that go on the trampoline and go do some reps you know what i mean and uh and i'm i'm more like that which i think is more what you're saying don't don't falsely tell yourself all this poo poo about how oh i'm a great person and blah 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 cuz you might be actually psyching yourself out never mind the fact that other parts of your brain aren't believing you and all that it's it's what comes down with the, what gives me confidence every day is when i get to wake up and think about the stuff i've accomplished before today the small, the good, the bad, the ugly, the questionable ones even, you know, and it's that resume that I've given myself through real world events that really builds my confidence. You can't falsely be confident in, you know, these helicopter coaches and helicopter parents that, you know, are there thinking that it's their job to make it a little bit easier for their kid so the kid can gain confidence. It's in my world, that's completely wrong. It does the complete opposite of that. It basically says to the kid, you're too stupid to do this yourself. So I'm going to do it for you. And of course, the coach doesn't think that that's what they're saying. But again, back to the miscommunication, that's what a young developing brain says every time mommy and daddy either stop them from doing something or tell them no or tell them to get down because they're going to get hurt. They're basically already creating this um, you know, separation of communication. And we really want to bring that together, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I think uh, you gave a, a couple of good examples of, you know, the the intended outcome of, of that activity that I specifically mentioned and, and numerous others is simply a way of reframing how we look at things. Yeah. Now, it, it can be as elemental as, you know, the glass is half empty, it's half full. If five things happened today that we're happy about and five things happened that we're not happy about, we have the option of focusing on the five that are more helpful. It's just that if we don't train ourselves, our default setting is to obsess about the negative. Yeah, because that's the thing that's going to kill you. Which is where most people are coming from, and that's that tip that tends to be where I start with. 
with with most people or with most teams. And you gave some really good examples of reframing things. You know, not not a failure, just you know something about the eventual success or impending delayed success. success. It? Yeah, it's just delayed success. Delayed just... success. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same same functional outcome, but we're we're describing it differently. So we're going to file it away differently. Yeah. And we are going to build more uh, more of a success driven vocabulary over time. Yeah. So it's basically, uh, um, you know, if we get back to you know to the extreme examples of you know how do you build mental resilience in soldiers, um, you become very careful about how you frame things because that environment is so unforgiving that if you focus on the wrong things no one's going to come out of their tent in the morning because holy crap, how scary is that universe that they operate in? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there, so it's, you can't change what the externalities are. All, all we can do is reframe how we're going to operate within what is admittedly a very exacting, challenging operational context, which is what sports are. So it's not even fear. So what you don't, Go ahead. No, it's, 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 I, so you, when you're looking at fear, you're not really conquering fear. What you're doing more, it seems to me, is putting athletes into a success mind state that then, you know, it's not just in the gym, it's everywhere. Because if you, it's not like you're going to be a negative person outside and then all of a sudden be positive in the gym. And you're not going to be a positive person in the gym, but exactly. negative outside and all that. So you're really saying, kids, before you start getting into hardcore gymnastics or any sports, you really just need to put yourself into what it means to be a successful type of person, like an entrepreneur or someone that just always the next thing, better, always positive, always go, go, go. There's no such thing as failure. You're saying that that really is your number one go-to in dealing with athletes. Is that correct? Um, in, in a sense, um, if we're talking about you know, how fear relates to all of that, it's not fear elimination, it's fear management. Some days you're only going to have a little bit of it. Some days you may have a lot. You don't always get to pick when those days happen, and sometimes those days happen when you have to compete. Okay, so let's figure out a way to get you not so freaked out by fear. Okay, it's, it doesn't have to be as scary as a lot of people paint it as being. It's so a good thing. How uh, it's your seatbelt tells you if idea, you're being dumb. Yeah, um, you know we uh, we know that nothing's deadlier than a car. Yet we're going to be in a car sometime today. Odds are, willingly, no one had to like drag us into the car. You know we're going to jump in and go. Um, so we know that while we're driving the car, bad things can happen. We might even see one or two near bad things happen right in front of us. We're still going to drive. We're never going to get so afraid of uh, death and dying that we stop driving a car. I mean that that's a, that's a very rare and you know emotionally vulnerable individual that that would do that. So if we can do it with that, we can do it with anything. Okay, we know that you know, there are men and women who train to be firefighters. Okay, if you want to be scared, run into a burning building where you can't see and can barely breathe and you start to realize that your breathing apparatus is failing. Okay, that's terrifying. And yet next week they're going to do it all over again. Why? Because they believe in what they're doing. It's important. And they're trusting the process. They're trained for this. They've they've got some backup measures. If one thing goes down, they're, they're going to do something else. And they're just going to continue to problem solve. That's that's gymnastics. That's that's trampoline. That's everything. Yes, it can be scary, but so. That, that's well, that's an interesting. That, uh, I try to get people to look at fear. It's like, oh, I'm afraid right now. Okay, well, uh, I'm also hungry. Uh, it's time to compete. Then I probably won't be so scared, and also I can get something to eat. Yeah, that's it's just, a... if we can't demystify the power of fear, that's when we really get uh, close to sort of this ideally strong version of ourselves. You know, to me, strength isn't, you know, 
overcoming things and, and making those things disappear. It's to me being strong is I do what I want when I want, regardless of how I might be feeling at the time. That's a strong person. Well, that's and I, I like the, the fact that you said that, and um, I think it's it's true. You know, like when I do my regular day to day stuff, you know, I'm constantly trying to focus more on what's the, what the good's gonna come out of it. But obviously, I have those natural sort of, oh, what if people don't like this, or what if that doesn't work, or what if this happens or that. But I naturally live more in a positive state because, like you said, you need that passion first because I don't care how good your training is. If you don't have the passion to go through the bumps and scrapes, then you're, you are going to be in fear because, well, you don't really have the motivation to need it. So maybe it's maybe a sign of fear also isn't just um, you're not ready for the skill. Maybe a sign of fear is you just don't actually really want to be there, you know, because I had this conversation with some people online and they said, I said like, look, um, you know, you need to explore, you need to do new things with your athletes. They need to try new stuff or they're just not going to learn basically. And they said, yeah, but then they could get hurt. Well, I'm like, well, you know, at the end of the day, then I gotta be, I gotta be the bad guy here and say, well, how much do you really care about the sport as a community then? Because if you care so little that you're not going to A, sacrifice yourself, you should be sacrificing yourself. And everyone who knows me knows I've sacrificed a lot out of myself for this. But then you as a coach also need to sacrifice. And the athletes need to know that there is a sacrifice to build a sport as a sport. And that comes with injuries and all that sort of stuff. And the problem is that they seem to think that they can't, they can improve, but never have to sacrifice that risk and they'll still get improvements. That's a really interesting point, and I think that uh, you know if we can substitute terms, we can substitute the word fear with risk. You know, just getting athletes okay with the idea that um, not only are some techniques in, in this uh, very specific athletic context uh, risky, but you know, golf is risky. You know, you still have if it's important to you. You know, you have all of the emotional uh, challenges of. What if I, I don't look good doing it? What if I disappoint myself, my coaches, my family, or whatever? Um, that's also a risk. And we need to find the best ways to help our athletes deal with managing those risks. I think it comes down to a good training. I just... Yeah, it was just interesting the way you said it. I hadn't thought about the actual passion of the sport as being a big factor in your fear. And I don't think anyone's ever really talked about that too much where like how much do you really care? Because like put it like you're talking about soldiers all the time. Well, you obviously don't love your country if you're not going to put yourself at risk for it. Sorry, sorry people that think that they're doing something good for the community by not risking, but how many of you would really stand up and die for your country? I have a lot of respect for those people that really put themselves in harm's way. It's very easy to go and work at McDonald's and pay your taxes and say, see, I'm a good paying citizen. I'm looking at the guys or girls that really do something. They risk a lot of their lives, and that's the people that I really respect because they don't have to do that. They could just go work at McDonald's and pay their taxes and still technically say that they're contributing with taxes, but that's not good enough for me. I'm the kind of guy that says, look, you better put your neck on the line literally if you're going to say that you truly love this sport and you truly love where it could go and you want to build it. Otherwise, you're just a freeloader basically using everyone else's risk because there's the first guy who did the backflip. Well, he risked everything. Right? No one had ever known if it could be possible. You know, so you're basically you're, you're, you're dancing on the graves of the people that basically built your sport and you're saying you're just too scared to go and explore and try to create something new to bring back to the beehive. You're just going to sponge off everyone else's hard work and sacrifice. I don't like that type of person. I say get off your butt, go and explore something new, bring it back to the, to the nest and we all can celebrate together. But if you got nothing new to bring back to the nest, I don't really value as a bird or as a bee or whatever the analogy is. I want to see what you're willing to risk. Yeah. And uh, obviously that's a that's a touchy one. Person. Not everybody has that. Well, and that's and that's the thing, and you know, and that's where I get into conflicts with people because they're like, "Well, no, I'll just do the sport." And I won't risk anything. I'll just do everything that I was told and never try anything new because it's dangerous. But look how much I care about the sport. You can't say that at the same time in my world. In my world, 
You, you care about the sport yeah. because you're fighting for that thing and it becomes blood, sweat, tears and broken necks and broken limbs and all that. And you're willing to sacrifice knowing that. And when you talk to a bunch of uh, different people that have gone through that, it's not like the veterans are coming back saying, screw the country. They're saying, no, it was worth that risk and I would do it again. And that's, yeah. that's what I'm looking yeah. for. And that they knew the risk on the front end. And they accepted it. They have to know the risk. Yes, and, that's that's yeah. yeah. And it was and it was worth the risk, you know. So for going back to your uh, sports analogy, uh, yeah, you you obviously are someone that is passionate and and is all about integrity. And I'm I'm getting a clear sense that people who are uh, trying to fake that are are not people that you would uh, be spending time. with. With. No, but they're the ones that tend to try to tell me how to live my life and, you know, want to be the critics. But I'm like, well, what have you done for the <laughs> sports? What have you done? Because I know your name never comes up in the, the board meetings or the discussions and stuff like that. So I have to question your resume, you know, and then they get all pissed off because they know they don't have a resume. And I say, well, I do have a bit of a resume. It's growing every day and I'm not comfortable yet. I'm a very hungry guy, you know, in that sort of way. But at least I got something. You know, what do you got? And as yeah. long as you got something, I'm, I'll give you credit. Even if I think personally mine's better, I will still give you credit for it, right? But the problem is they believe that they just don't have to show it. They, they can uh, say, oh, uh, you know, I love my spouse, but I never have to have TV dinner with them. I never have to not talk to the guys and go to the bar. I, I can just have a free relationship. Not in my world, not, not the way I see the world, you know what I mean? And not through my lens, just the way I hear businesses talking and people that are successful talk. They don't talk that way. They talk like what you're talking. You just shut up and get it done, you know what I mean? And that's all I care about is getting it done. And if you guys don't want to get it done, then just stay out of my way. But don't get in my way just because you're not doing it. Yeah, that's uh... – it's interesting. I uh, sent out an uh, email to my email list today. It was specifically about critics, and it had to do with uh, Beethoven's Second Symphony. There's another musical analogy, uh, and how in the local newspapers, uh, I think it was the, the Leipzig uh, newspaper, scathing condemnation. He was likening the symphony to a dying, lumbering beast. Ooh. that needed to be put out of its own agony. This Ouch. is Beethoven's Second Symphony. Now, no one remembers that critic from 1802. That's Everyone true. in the world knows Beethoven. That's true. And it's, it's just an interesting, you know, the, the innovators, regardless of the field of endeavor, uh, have to, it, part of the risk for them is just not being embraced by the world at the time or large sections of the world. So when you're doing something like what you do, uh, you have an innovative approach, you know, to coaching and teaching. Uh, a lot of people are going to have a problem with it. Who? Well, the status quo people. Yeah. But it wouldn't be authentic for you to live in a way that makes those people happy. No. You've got to make you happy. And you also have to change the world a little bit because I think that's what we all, all have to do, and that's what you're doing. So, yeah, we, we're, we're moving unwittingly from mental toughness into tough philosophy, I think. Well, yeah, it's interesting. And, and it all connects. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It's all, it's all connects the way you look at you know, building a business or building a gym club or whatever it is that your thing is you got to be mentally tough for it. And if you're the type of person that breaks down on vault, well, you're not going to be the type of person that also runs a successful gym and you know uh, runs a successful business or really influences people in any even small sort of way. You know what I mean? It's just something new. You're, you're not going to be creating anything new. You're basically just going to be helping everybody else. You're almost like a evolutionary, uh, evolution's assistant. You don't actually ever come up with anything. You just sort of ride the coattails, and I don't like that. I, I like to be riding the waves, and it's fun. It's not because I really care if people know who I am or anything like that. I just want to see trampoline evolve. I'm, I'm bored of it, you know, and that's where my critics get upset because they're not bored. But I'm like, well, hold on. Look at all the opportunities you have here that you guys haven't even tried to even think about. And that's, that's where I differ. You know? 
Uh, the burden of being a world changer. Well, yeah, I don't know if it's going to change the world yet. I'm not that arrogant, you know. I'm just trying to see what will happen. And the way I look at it is even if it doesn't change the world or anything like that and we're, and we're failures and in a couple of years and freestyle trampoline is complete poo-poo and no one ever likes it and it just dies, well, then at least we can learn something from it. So, again, it's back to delayed success. And then I know I'm just going to jump to something else if I want to. I'm that kind of guy. I just like building stuff, you know. And um, that's what I bring to my trainings is just building skills. I don't, I don't train skills. I build them systematically. And I think of it the same way when in life. And I, I think if people looked at regular day-to-day -day life, how do you live your day-to-day -day life, you can bring that to the gym. And I think that is going to help put everything in perspective as well, as you were saying earlier. Yeah, inter interesting way that you uh, sort of summed that up. And, you know, as we kind of get into this uh, uh, philosophical portion of the discussion, it's what's interesting to me is when I work with people long term, which is that's the minor minority of people that I do work with. Uh, it's, it's a commitment. Uh, but for them, we rapidly move beyond things like. Uh, you know, mental strategies for competition. Eventually, where that always takes us is into a realm beyond simple mind hacks, if you will. And it takes us into the realm of who are you as a person? You know, what are you about? And we start working on things that really ha look more like character development than just mental resilience skills for an athlete. Because I, I think at the end of the day, if I'm going to truly teach someone what it takes to strengthen themselves internally, it's about the, the entire person. You can't separate out any one facet. They all operate in concert with one another, or at least they need to if you're going to reach your full potential. So it doesn't surprise me when you and I talk, and I, I get these uh, extra flashes of who Greg is in terms of you know, pushing the envelope, trying to innovate, trying to make your chosen discipline better, to, to be more interesting, to grow in relevance and reach, uh, because all of those things have to do with uh, what you're doing. It's not just about, well, I need X amount of physical skill. I need X amount of, you know, physical strength. Uh, I need X amount of, you know, focus and concentration in order to, to do my athlete things. You're, you're looking beyond the athlete model. You're looking beyond the entrepreneur model. You're looking beyond the, the tribe development model. It's all of these things sort of happening simultaneously. So, I think that sort of speaks to the fact that if any of us, regardless if we're going to be the best athlete, we can be the best coach we can be, we need to become the best person that we can be. And only then are we really going to get in touch with all that we're uh, capable of. I agree. And I think you really summed it up quite nicely there where, you know, people focus on these mind tricks. And I hear I've heard industry psychologists say, well, I'm just going to push through it. I can still do it. I can they just try to talk themselves into this. To me, it's very dangerous, first of all, because obviously there's a reason that you're already having doubts. Maybe you should go analyze that first. But then also the fact that they they seem to be trying to tell children. And I, for me, like you're supposed to have a Ph.D. and you're telling kids this. It seems to go against everything I've read in the textbooks that your your cortex is somehow going to overpower your amygdala and the back of your brain and all that stuff and your uh, reticular activating system as you were talking about earlier your alarm system you you really think you've been built so that you can override that on a whim no that's just absolutely poo poo there's no way that you could do that so i like what you're saying is that it's a holistic approach again back to back to the start where you know it what kind of person are you you know it's not vault that's the problem. And it's not the skill that's the problem. It's the why you allowed the skill to become a problem. You know, because for me, I have problems all day, every day. We tried to do an app a year ago and I just blew through like 15, 20 grand and it never worked. But I just kept going and I'm still going and we're still now relaunching it in a whole different way. Even though we lost 20 grand, I'm not there crying about it saying, oh, I won't get my money back. 
No, it's, it's, it's about knowing that your failure is part of it. And are you the type of person that stops when failure happens? Or are you the type of person that conquers failure to become successful? And I think that's the heart of fear, or at least one of the crucial aspects that people don't really talk about. Uh, absolutely, because it's not fun to talk about. And you know, no one likes to talk about struggling. And no one likes to struggle. But there is no success without it. Yeah. So you're either you're either going to uh, be able to handle that, and, and it goes back to a lot of sort of the resilience topics we were talking about the earlier part of our conversation. Uh, we have to get um, okay with the idea that this isn't easy, and the fact that it isn't easy uh, speaks to its worthiness of, of a quest. I don't want an easy quest. I, I don't want something I can get to by next week. Okay, there's there's nothing transformative or meaningful in that. Yep. But uh, it in the the culture which we spoke of as well uh, as it exists now, um, we have a lot of uh, mechanisms for surrender. We make it very easy to give up. We make it easy to rationalize giving up. Well, that's pretty hard. It might not be for you. Well, nothing's for anybody. You know, we, we've used some classical music examples. That's not for anybody. You don't just fall into that and do it well. You know, it's, even if you're quote-unquote talented, whatever that means, it's excruciatingly hard work. You know, The yeah. trampoline is an exacting uh, modality. Okay, it's it's not going to make things easy on you. No, I think... and the more that you try, the more that you try to get out of yourself, you know, the the harder it's going to be, and uh, it, it will provide an opportune vehicle for not just manifesting personal excellence, but taking that excellence to the edge, you know, of of what you currently think is is reasonable. Yeah, and what's reasonable now was not reasonable for you five years ago. It would have been ridiculously risky five years ago, perhaps. You know, for a lot of people, de depending on where they are in their developmental journey. So, um, yeah, what have we learned, Greg? I think we've learned that uh, success requires a lot of work. It's just that the way we said it was so much more interesting than just saying it that way. <laughs> <laughs> their, their whole podcast summed up into uh, one sentence. <laughs> All right, Mike, before we end off for this episode, can you give us a couple little maybe tips for the young kids coming up and they're, they've probably listened to this and go, oh man, I don't, am, I, am I motivated? Am I not motivated? I don't really know. Is there any ways, um, little tips, uh, exercises or questions they can ask themselves to figure out if they are motivated and doing it is for them or that they should just kind of try to do something else instead because they're just they're not there for that reason is there any advice you could give to our younger audience well that's a really interesting question this idea of motivation um i think that motivation is uh, a difficult term uh, for a young athlete to wrap themselves around. Uh, a, we need to know specifically what it means, and it may mean something different to the mom and dad. It may mean something different to the coach. So that creates some challenges right there. And motivation may be a bit distant-seeming. What I'm interested in is something that any young athlete can answer right now, and that is uh, – is there, is there stuff about this thing that you like? Now, I didn't say everything. And I didn't say, do you like this thing? Because you won't like everything about it. But is there stuff about this thing? We'll use gymnastics as an example. Is there stuff about gymnastics that you like? And they'll probably say yes. And I'll say, great. Um, now, is there some stuff about gymnastics that you don't like so much? And if they're honest, they'll say, yeah. I'll say, is it more like than not like? And if they say, yeah, it's like, okay, well, let's, that's all we need to know. This is something that's mostly fun or we mostly get stuff out of it that we like. And there's a, an opportunity to sort of contemplate life right there because nothing is, is truly binary. It's not all great. It's not all bad. So if we know that we like this thing, 
and for the most part, then let's explore everything there is to explore. Now, we might be exploring in the context of fun. Now, how do you have the most fun in gymnastics? Well, for some kids, it's learning a new thing. And, you know, for some kids, it's it's something else. But let's put ourselves in that laboratory, right? And let's commit to when we're in the laboratory, we're going to work hard and we're going to enjoy what working hard can bring to us, which is do, you know, not only spending the time there with people that we care about doing something that we enjoy, but learning about ourselves, learning how to do new things, overcoming new challenges. Um, I think sometimes as coaches, we feel pressured to make everything you know, just re- cosmically relevant. And sometimes that's great. You know, it, it's good to have a really moving speech before an important competition. But day in, day out, let's let's enjoy what we're doing and let's do it well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not someone who really obsesses about the motivation issue. I like to get it because I think motivation feels like that's something down the road. Let's let's talk about immediate things. Let's talk about now. And, you know, enjoying this thing, we can talk about that now. You know, uh, struggling to enjoy this thing, hey, we can talk about that now, too. Think maybe today is a tough day at the gym. Awesome. There, there's some really good things that we can be talking about there. And uh, that also poses some interesting challenges for the coach. How, how do we make challenging days seem like relevant, meaningful days? Figure that out. Yeah. Well, how, well, how do you communicate about stuff that's hard in a way that, you know, makes me more agreeable to get them getting back up on the ranks. Well, what I like about what you said there was, you know, everyone gets bogged down by these uh, definitions of motivation, whatever the heck that means, you know what I mean? And you saying that, you know what, just skip the question of your motivator or not. That's up to interpretation and you somehow first have to agree with other people's interpretations before you can even find the answer. And as you give the interpretation, your actual real thoughts are becoming biased anyway. So you never really will know. So skip the question that really has no answer and just get down to brass tacks and say, write out the five things you love about your Maastricht and hopefully they're just the one or two things that you don't like so much and make a plan about how to make those things you don't like a little bit more fun, but how to capitalize on those things you already do love and to integrate it all together. And I, I really like that message. It goes back to what we were talking about a few moments ago. You know, it's being able to reframe things so that not only they make more sense, but that we get more from them. Yeah, it makes sense. And don't get bogged down by labels that really just don't mean anything. You know, it's funny how many times you think about it every day, you know, oh, I feel good. Well, what does that actually mean? You know, oh, well, this was lucky. Well, what does that mean exactly? And you realize very quickly how many openly generic terms we have that really mean nothing, almost like the word fear itself. You know, you can then just say, well, no, I'm not in fear. I just have this one problem that I haven't solved yet. That's what fear is. It's a problem that you haven't solved. So skip just uh, uh, demonifying it by giving it these negative labels and all this sort of stuff and self-talking your way out of a problem. Just skip all the labels and get right to the brass tacks and say, what actually is going on here? And I, I think too many people get caught up in the cloud of positivity and morality and you know um, motivation and all this stuff but they don't really dig deep enough and i that's what i really like about your approach mike it's got to be fast i don't always have a lot of time with these people yeah exactly you got to get right to the point i love it well thanks a lot mike i really appreciate getting a chance to get right to the point with you here on our show and i definitely want to chit chat with you more i know there's another wealth of knowledge in there that we've barely even tapped into so we'll have to get you on for next season but thank you one more time for sharing with me and sharing with our audience your thoughts on you know motivation and mental toughness and just getting a little more philosophical than some might like but you know it's it's the conversations that we need to have so thank you so much my pleasure greg enjoyed it guys enjoyed and learned a few things. There's a big world out there worth exploring and I'm happy to be able to bring these great experiences right to you through this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast and learn something, please share and take a screen grab of our funky cartoons and hashtag GRT certified for a chance to win a shout out to our community. Also, please leave us a review to be part of helping this information get out into the industry. It's much appreciated. 
Along with these podcasts, we have a large online content hub that we call the GRT Network, with many other interviews and full tutorials and written content discussing everything about acrobatics. We will be constantly growing this archive of videos like a cross between Netflix and Wikipedia for anyone in the acrobatic industry. We also have a complete online educational program for athletes of all levels that provides a do-it-yourself pathway to success for any acrobat. Check out our constantly growing library of playlists that will teach you anything from tightening up your social media, to how to get around fear, to even learning all the biology that underlies all your acrobatic skills. We work very hard with our team around the world to provide this exclusive content for you and appreciate any donations made to the FTA to help keep these episodes coming at you. And if you want all the content, become a GRT Network full member to get exclusive content before everyone else and access to special discounts and giveaways through our amazing global partners. Thanks guys, see you next episode.